either you have very, very fast processing, okay? Uh, or imagine, imagine that you have an exponential function. And this exponential function, say e to the minus 100t. So, it, so how many samples should you take until, until it, it, it dies out? So you, you should have very, very fast processor which, which samples in order to detect this. Otherwise, if the next sample, because your processor is, is slow, if the next sample... Is going to take up to some longer time, it is going to be... Zero. Zero. So <laughs> if you have a fast decay, you need many, many samples in the, in the first couple of microseconds, nanoseconds, or something, in order to, to measure something. Otherwise, you measure at zero, and then the next one <laughs> next zero. Is, is, is zero. So you cannot detect. Therefore, this is actually no uh, the, the problem, the, the relation between uh, how fast can you catch, acquire the data, and register them. Of course, if you have enough, enough point, time points, you can say, OK, I know that it is exponential, or it is a sum of exponential because I have multiple poles. I, I, uh, systems don't have only, only one pole. You have multiple poles. So if you have multiple poles, so you have actually a summation of many, many decaying, exponentially decaying function. One multiplied by A1, by A2, by A3, and so on. There are many, many methods which can tell you which uh, exponential fun uh, factor, which sigma, are involved, and uh, which amplitudes. So you just need to catch the sum. So I have a sum of, let me write it, write it here down. So what, what I, I measure, m of t, is summation, say, of n equals 1 to n, of a n e to the minus uh, sigma n t, a, a sum of exponential. This is, this is a typical uh, transient response. Uh, if I have here, if you, if you count, say, n equals 10, so you have uh, 10 a n's and 10 sigma n's. OK, if you measure 20, at least, if you can measure 20 measurements, <coughs> Imagine now this is t, and what you measure some something like that, because it is not a single exponential, but it is, yeah. So if you if you can measure here very fast until uh, the uh, uh, before the, uh, the 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 total response vanishes, so you can have this 20, 10 times two. If your processor is slow, so I I could measure once here. And the next one is here. So I don't have enough data to help me uh, uh, determining what are the a n's and what are the sigma n's. OK? This is the way. Uh, if you are interested in this subject, uh, you can look for sing singularity expansion method. This is one of the known methods for uh, recovering the system poles from time domain measurements. So you, you trigger the system, and you uh, collect enough data. And using this data, you can uh, retrieve, or you can have back <coughs> the uh, system poles. Because of course, I, I took here the uh, case where uh, if this is the S-plane, so you have read. Usually, for, for real, real systems, you may also have two complex conjugate pair, uh, a, a, conjugate, a con, uh, complex. Con, com, complex conjugate pair here, there. So in this case, this is also multiplied by cosine omega n t plus phi n, something like that. It is not only. Uh, exponential decaying, but you have some oscillation. This is the, the, the ultimate general, general, general case. So, and, and, and based on that, you can uh, have how many poles could you catch, or could you? Because if if some poles are, imagine that ten poles are slow enough, but you have here maybe one hundred poles which are so fast that you couldn't catch them in the next measurement, lose them. <coughs>
So, so therefore, you, you, you talk about the time resolution. And, and uh, as I told you before, there are many, many physical phenomena which are so fast that you can't, uh, you can't uh, catch them. You can't, you can't uh, acquire them. Uh, and and uh, there are many Nobel Prize uh, uh, recipients. I think at least one. His, his achievement was just to have a camera. Of course, it is, it is an equipment which is so fast or which, is, which can enlarge the time axis. So what happens in femtosecond, it is, it is mapped on, say, microsecond, so that I can, I can see what, what, is, what is going on. So uh, last time, we stopped here. We uh, classified imaging in zeroth order, which we, I, I hope that you understand what, what I mean with zeroth order. So actually, we are looking, it's very, very trivial. We are looking for just one unknown. And this, I called it zeroth order, because it's just one point. Uh, and we saw already that uh, we can stay in free space back, so behind this interface, and illuminate, so excite a plane wave, measure its reflection, and based on that, we can find out this constant. Task is done. The next task is to go from zeroth order to one dimension, or zero dimensional to one dimension, which means for me, I will subdivide it in two categories. First, what is called stratified medium. Stratified medium, I have a number of dielectric layers. I don't know the thicknesses. I don't know the dielectric constant. All what I know, it is, it is a, a number of dielectric layers. I don't know the thicknesses, the number or, or the dielectric constant. And I'm staying back. I, I can't dig into. And I would like to make something in order to find out, and this is my task, how many layers, what is the thickness of each layer, and what is the dielectric constant or the permittivity of each layer. In other words, I would like to construct, I call it construct or reconstruct, because it is, it is you, based on, on your measurements, I would like to reconstruct this permittivity profile. This is x. I know here it is epsilon naught. This is epsilon of x. I will jump here to epsilon 1. I don't know the jump. And after a distance, say, uh, x1, I have another. Uh, no, let us not go below epsilon naught because it is. Uh, uh, all, all, all known materials have, have more than epsilon naught. I have here epsilon 2, <coughs> maybe epsilon 3, epsilon 4, and so on. Here x2, x3, and so on. This is the curve or the profile I would like to retrieve based on my measurements here. So this is first uh, the description of our task. For, uh, for, for the purpose of developing equations, in order to use language which is, uh, uh, which is preferable or preferred by electrical engineers, uh, instead of dealing with electric field, magnetic field, let us deal with uh, <coughs> voltage and current. Voltage and current in the sense, in, in, a, in an equivalent sense. It is not a real voltage and a real current. It's just, let us see, if, if I have a plane wave, and this plane wave, I know that it propagates in x direction, I have, say, EY and HZ. Let us take the magnitude of the electric field as an equivalent voltage, okay? And the magnitude of the, of the, uh, of the magnetic field as an equivalent current. So this is actually the way we, uh, 
are going uh, to deal with our phenomena, you may also imagine that this is, this is a transmission line. Because in principle, there is no big difference between <coughs> the behavior of a plane wave and the behavior of voltage and current within a transmission line. Within a transmission line, you have also, if, if you have a coaxial transmission line, the voltage, say something like that, the voltage is the integration of the electric field from this point to this point. The current is the integration of the magnetic field along any closed loop, including the inner conductor. Okay? This is, these are real voltage and real currents. But as you see, they are proportional to the transverse magnetic field or the transverse electric field. And the behavior within a TEM line, like a two-wire line or a coaxial line, is exactly like that of plane waves. And um, all experiments done by Dr. Akhtar, because Dr. Akhtar uh, uh, conducted his PhD in Germany under my supervision, in the uh, late 90s, uh, beginning of 2000, and we didn't, didn't excite uh, a real plane wave. We, got, we had a, a coaxial line, and we put the materials inside the lines uh, and used the vector network analyzer uh, so that uh, all measurements and uh, all setup was put in an in a oversized coaxial cable. So we have a inner conductor, outer conductor, and you put uh, slices of, of uh, uh, different dielectrics, different thicknesses, and you try to retrieve the profile. Okay? Uh, it's, it's easier to measure, easier to uh, calibrate the network analyzer for measurements and so on. Of course, this doesn't mean that you will not be able to measure in free space. But in free space, the measurements are a little bit tough. In order to calibrate, for those of you who are acquainted with microwave measurements, uh, you need before uh, involving a network analyzer in the measurements, you need to calibrate. So, and for calibration, you need what is called standards. And the standards in, in a closed system measurements are easy to obtain. No. Uh, the standards in free space uh, are really very, very challenging. But, but you can also measure in, in, in free space. Okay. So, therefore, uh, we will take along the line or along the stratification. We will take, we will distinguish between forward wave. Uh, the voltage of the forward wave will be uh, designated by plus, and it is taken as say EY. Okay, and as you see, because it is forward, the propagation constant it is with the minus JKX. Okay, and the uh, current, the correspond uh, corresponding current is I plus e to the minus JKX. Uh, the relation between, or the, the uh, quotient, uh, quotient uh, uh, between uh, the voltage and current is a characteristic impedance of the material. Don't forget, we will retrieve the permittivity through either the, uh, uh, the characteristic, or not the characteristic impedance. In this case, it is a characteristic impedance because it is a ratio between voltage and current. If it is a ratio between electric field and magnetic field, it's called entrancing impedance. But they are proportional. Uh, you, you still remember for a coaxial line, the, the, you have a, a factor of log, log of B over E or something like that. Okay? And this is here for the backward wave. <clears throat> so, for our stratification, let me first start with... Uh, just one layer, because in, in just one layer, we will be concerned, uh, say, let us come back to the free space. So we have here epsilon naught, say it's epsilon one, and we have here d1 and or, or x1, and here epsilon naught again. So this is the next step. I would like to retrieve a pulse, which is this pulse here. I don't know the height. 
I don't know the thickness, and this is my uh, first one-dimensional image. So I uh, will do my measurements here. How many we will see in order to uh, find out what is epsilon 1 and what is x1. Good. Uh, we may use here the concept of input impedance, or we may also use, and I believe that most of you, uh, so you, you had what is called multiple reflection. The, the multiple reflection itself, uh, you, you assume that you come here with one, a magnitude one. You will have between uh, medium zero, which is free space, and medium one, a local reflection coefficient. What, so I would like to stress here the difference between a reflection coefficient and a local reflection coefficient. The local reflection coefficient, you are coming from medium one to medium two. And as if the wave is you, you don't know what, what will happen later. So you see medium two as if it were infinitely extended. OK? This is what is called local reflection coefficient. We saw it before, I think, in the last, uh, in the last view graph. Uh, we have between free space and, uh, and half space filled with epsilon. You have a local reflection coefficient, because the local is a reflection coefficient in this case, of impedance of the, of the medium minus impedance of free space divided by the sum. And the transmission is given by twice the impedance of the unknown medium divided by the sum. So keep this in mind, because we'll use it uh, frequently. OK. Uh, if, you, if you have here one. So this is medium one, and this is uh, this is medium zero, and this is medium one. So we will have here a local. Let me call it R one zero. So the first is the next, and the last is is when when you uh, initiate the the wave. Okay. So we have R one zero, and we know here that R one zero. I know that many of you have this before, but just to refresh your information, uh, because we will go step by step until we understand the whole thing. So R10 is Z1 minus Z0 divided by Z1 plus Z0. And we have also T10, which is twice Z1 divided by Z1 plus Z0. So we will have here T10. And upon propagating to the next, ref, uh, next uh, reflection interface, uh, the wave itself will suffer from or will uh, experience a delay. The delay itself, if you don't understand me, because I assume now a, a minimum background in, in electromagnetics and in transmission line theory, so you will have here a, a delay I have t10 e to the minus g theta. And for me, is theta is k, which I don't know, the wave number within this medium, times uh, x1. Don't forget, we would like to find x1 and k or z. So these are actually the uh, unknowns which we have. So uh, k includes epsilon, z includes also epsilon, and x1 includes the thickness. Don't, we, we, we look just for two values, which are x1 and, and epsilon, but epsilon itself can be interpreted as z or k. Let us see. OK, so when I am here, I will go further by t from 1 to 0, so it will be t0, 1, times t1, 0, e to the minus g theta, right? And I will re reflect here with r, 0, 1, 
time that, which is T10 e to the minus j theta. And we'll come back to this here with a further delay, again e to the minus another j theta. So we'll have here R10 T10 e to the minus j twice theta. Coming back, uh, coming through here with T01, because I'm coming now from 1. So I have T01, T10, R10, e to the minus g to i theta. And here back, I have another reflection, which is R01. So I have R10, R01. T10 e to the minus g to i theta. I will not spend the whole day uh, going back and forth. I will stop here. <laughs> okay, so let us now see uh, again. This is refreshing your information about multiple reflection. Uh, if we compare the state of the uh, wave here and there, we'll find out that that each round corresponds to multiplying what you have here by the ratio between this one and this one. Because I started here with T10. I started again in the, in the second round by T10, R01, R01, uh, R10, R01, e to the minus g to I feel. Uh, let me here, we have, I think, I think uh, this is again R01. Sorry, sorry for that. And here, I'm coming from 1. This is also 0, 1. I'm, I'm, this is 0, 1, 0, 1, right. So we have here 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. Because, because both reflections, you are coming from 1, and you are reflected at, at 0. So you have R0, 1. So if you look to this, you, you, you see very, very quickly that you started by T10. You in the first round, the second round is R01 squared by e to the minus j to i theta. Okay? Which means for us that uh, when, when I don't need the, uh, the screen, I will raise it and I will use my surface book. But now I, I need both. And actually, uh, the best situation was where to have two spots, one. But but do, do do we have another screen? No, not not the projector. No, no, just 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 a minute because I need two screens, one screen for the PowerPoint and one screen for the revision. But but if we have here, it is not a problem. I will I will. Okay, uh, let us let us first because I need I need both now because uh, you know this switching itself is is not fast because I I have let, let us let us do it this way. If it is it is not comfortable for you, I will I will use this place here and then go to this place and then uh, when I don't need my PowerPoint at all, I will uh, switch to the Surface Book and we will have everything uh, done here. Okay, so I think you can, you can, we can now uh, have an expression for the total reflection coefficient. So, and and when I co call uh, to, uh, tell you total reflection coefficient, what I can measure within the free space. I am not inside the the uh, stratified material or or the one one step material here. So I have the total reflection coefficient. Let us call it R. Is the the first one is. R10. The second one, if you look here, it was T01, T10, R01, e to the minus j, j to i theta. So we have T01, R10, uh, no, T01, T10, or <coughs> 0110R01 e to the minus j to i theta. And this guy here is multiplied once by one. This is the first one. 
And then each turn, it will be multiplied by a quantity, I will call it B for Bs, plus B squared, plus and so on. So, and we have here B, we have it already, it was Z, uh, R, 0, 1 squared, e to the minus J to I think. This is here a geometrical series. So, 1 plus B plus, and the, the series itself converges if the magnitude of the base is less than 1. If you look to the magnitude of the base, it has, this was our base here. R01, R01, which is R01 squared e to the minus j. The magnitude of, of e to the minus j twice theta is 1, and this is always uh, smaller than 1. And you square it, so you, you, you are sure that uh, the uh, series converges. And we have the expression itself is R is R10 plus T01, T10, R01, e to the minus j twice theta uh, divided by 1 minus base, which is R01 squared e to the minus j twice theta. So this is actually the expression which you may have had as an exercise, maybe in the first semester or second semester. It depends. OK? This is actually the expression for the reflection coefficient measured outside the layer. And we would like now to think how can, make, how can we make use of this reflection coefficient in order to find out the thickness of the layer and the dielectric constant of the lay. If we look to the uh, different expressions, let us summarize them again. So we have one of the uh, terms is theta is k times, we, we call this x1, x1 is unknown, k itself is omega, omega is known, x1 is unknown, and here square root of epsilon 1 mu nu. We, we uh, agreed that we will not have a magnetic material. So this, this one includes x1 and uh, epsilon 1. The other quantities, we have any t, or say r01, it was z0 minus z1 divided by z0 plus z1. And if you look here, this is known, and you may say this is z0 in 1 minus the square root of mu naught over epsilon 1, z naught in 1 plus square root of mu naught epsilon 1, right? So the only thing which is unknown here in R01 is epsilon 1. So I have a function of epsilon 1. What do we have? What, uh, I think we have t, uh, t10 and t01. Let us write down them here. This is t10 is twice z1 divided by z1 plus z0 and t01 is twice z0 divided by z. And all these are functions of mu0 divided by epsilon0. So, um, at this point, let me. Let us have a, a little bit long discussion about the uh, approach we are going to apply for imaging in general, based on this very, very simple example. Because if we understand it, if we understand the weaknesses, if we understand the challenges. For this very simple case, 
we will understand it for the entire image. I have here, let me write down what I can measure. outside this is accessible it is R can you tell me how many things are in these in all these complicated expressions we have the frequency Omega we have the unknown x1 and we have epsilon 1 I, I make this as a semicolon so I have a quantity which is function of x1, epsilon 1, and omega. And I may look, I'm looking for x1 and epsilon 1. I can do measurements as much as I can. Now let us take this very, very simple example. I have, I can produce, say, R1 is R of x1, epsilon 1, and I measure at omega 1. And I can have R2 is R of x2, x1, epsilon 1, and I measure at another frequency, omega 2. We have here two nonlinear functions of, or, of x1, epsilon 1. One, I get it uh, from the measurements at omega 1, and the other one from the measurements at omega 2. Let us again come back to distinguishing between I have a number of unknowns and I have a number of measurements. The number of measurements here you can have as much as you can. You have a parameter, which is in this case the frequency. You can change the frequency, you have a measurement. Change the frequency, you have a measurement, and, and, and so on. Independent now of whether these measurements are really dependent or independent. This is one of our headache afterwards. Uh, let me distinguish between my equations are linear. In this case, I have two unknowns. And if I would have two linearly independent equations, I will have a unique solution. So in this case, if I would have had a linear relation, I just need to pay attention to take care of the, of the independency of the equations. Two independent equations will give me the unique equation. So I will concentrate in this case. It is not my case, but I, I just classify the problem. We have linear relations. In this case, all what we are going to take care of is whether we can produce through our measurements whether we can produce independent equations if we can produce enough independent equations equal to the number of unknowns i can find the number of unknowns uniquely by just inverting a matrix okay uh, as a graph you can say I will. I will, of course. Uh, so the one-dimensional case is: I have unknown x. I know the relation. It is linear. I measure. This is y of x. I measure here. This is y measured. This is calculated, this is measured, the intersection is my unknown. I have an equal. If I have two unknowns and two equations, imagine now that you have your two unknowns are y and x. So first plane is something like that. This is one of the equations. And you take a measurement, so you will cut it in a line. Say, so you, you will cut, you, you have a plane, and the plane, plane is your measurements, and you will cut it in a line. 
And you have another one, because I, I, I would like to make it more complex. You have another one. And you cut it in another line. Let me now draw these two lines in, a, in the two-dimensional space x, y alone. So this is x and y. Say this is one line, which comes from measurements with the first plane. And this is one line, which comes from the measurements with the second plane. In this case, you have your solution. This is unknown number one, unknown number two. As you see here, the linearity itself guarantees there is always solution, and this solution is unique. All what I, I need to do, if, if my equations relating measurements to the unknown quantities, if they were linear, all what I have to, to do is to take care of the linear independency not to have two lines which are parallel. In this case, they will not cut. OK, so this is the first challenge in imaging. Uh, because how, how to guarantee that the uh, measurements are linearly independent? Let us come back to our problem here. I told you, OK, I have omega, the frequency, as a parameter. But who tells me, or who can guarantee for me, that measuring at two different frequencies will really deliver two different values? You know, yes? Maybe you can explain this in a more, more, more detailed way. And this plane this and one? Yeah, Again? Yeah. OK. okay. So you mean the cutting, cutting yeah. the planes and so on? Yeah. OK, I will repeat again. Uh, I hope that I'm not confusing you by jumping from nonlinear and linear and so on. Uh, I know that the imaging is nonlinear, okay? But uh, assuming that it, it is linear or it were linear will simplify the analysis a little bit. But keep in mind, it is, not, it is nonlinear. But before going to the complexity of nonlinear and mixing two challenges or two problems, the two problems are the nonlinearity itself and the dependency or independency of the equations. Okay? Therefore, I decided to say, okay, let us assume that it, it were okay, linear in order to concentrate on the problem of dependency. And then we, when we understand the dependency and independency problem, I will move to the ultimate goal, which is, it is over that, nonlinear. Is my approach clear before I continue? So I assume now that these two equations in x1 and, y, and y1, which I said, OK, it is, uh, I will redraw again. x1 is x, y1 is y. So I have, from my analysis, or equivalently, from my simulator, because I analyzed here. We spent five minutes or 10 minutes in deriving multiple flexion and so on, and it was a nice exercise. Of course, a real problem is much more complicated than uh, multiple flexion with the, with the lots of assumptions we, we made. But you can say, OK, I have CST, I have HFSS. Uh, uh, these are very, very powerful, uh, very, very exact, or very, very accurate computer uh, uh, electromagnetic simulators. I can find out what is equivalent to this expression. Look, what, is, what was the expression? The expression, I assume that y is known and x is known, and I found the reflection coefficient. We define this before as the direct problem. I assume that I know that structure, the topology, and I can calculate the uh, reflection coefficient. Okay, this is a direct problem. Any simulator you can have, like uh, Microwave Studio from CST or HFSS, uh, is exactly the same. You give it the topology, 
you give it the dimensions, the, the electric constants, and all this, and it gives you back reflection coefficient, back scattering, and so on. This is one possibility. Or the other possibility, you have a very, very simplified problem. So I can do something like the multiple reflection. I do it intentionally just to show you, OK, when I know the structure, the problem itself is, is, is easy, simple, I can also find out an expression which will replace Microwave Studio or replace HFSS. So whether you derived a nice equation like that, or you rely on a simulator, a computer software, it is a C. It is a solution of the direct problem. What is the direct problem? I know the topology. It is not imaging. I know the topology. I give all parameters to the program or to my equation, and it gives me back the reflection coefficient. Okay? For imaging, we have the inverse problem. The inverse problem means I don't know the topology. In our case here, it was just x1 and epsilon 1. I don't know them. So all what I know is a relation between both at two different frequencies. And I assumed, OK, the first, free, the first relation, assuming it, it is linear, will be a plane. So what is plane? This is here, y, and this is x. OK, and this is f1 or of x and y. f1 of x and y is certainly something like that. Now come with, a, with your measurement. You measure a certain value. And this value here is a constant. So you have something like that, cutting, cutting the plane with a, another plane. Your measurement is parallel to the x, y plane. The two planes will cut in a straight line. Also, is going to be in coinciding that straight line. No, no. Uh, look, we, we, we are still in the first equation. First equation is a plane. Okay? Measurements is a plane parallel to the xy plane because you measure a constant. Cut the two planes, you get a line. A line. And this line, I will put it here. Say this is x and this is y. This is actually the two-dimensional representation of x and y. So this is the first line comes from intersection between the plane described by the first equation, say at omega 1, and your measurements. You get a line, ideally infinitely extended. I do the same with the second relation, measure, measurement at at omega 2, and another plane parallel, which is your real measurements, and another plane parallel to the xy plane. I get another line which say here. Ah, let me. Is it clear? Now, the linearity and the independency of the two equations both guarantee that I have one and only one solution, existence and uniqueness. So I can now have x and y. I, uh, is the repetition here has, has made it clear? So if you have any problem here, because it, it really, we, we can uh, uh, invest some more time here, because if you understand it, so you will come out of this series of lecture having a very, very good idea about what are the real problems in imaging. So for the frequency one, for first measurement, we got a plane of fxy. For the frequency one, we have a relation first. The relation is a plane. And, the and we have a measurement. Okay. Again, for frequency one, we have a relation. It is a plane, which I, I made it this way. And we measure at this one. We have another plane, which is, which is a measurement. They cut in a straight line. Clear? For relation number two, we have another plane and another measurement. So the measurement cuts the plane in another straight line. If we have independent, the two lines 
will cut at certain angle. If we are unlucky, and our hope that measuring at two different frequencies would give us two independent equations, they are really dependent, in this case we will not have a cut. Just to bring it nearer to, to you, you know that this theta, theta x was embedded in theta. And if you change theta by twice pi, just make the thickness of the layer uh, another, uh, so the, the original one uh, plus lambda by two of the operating frequency. You will have exactly the same measurements. So if you are unlucky and you measured at two frequencies, which make the thickness of the layer within multiple of lambda by two, so you will not have independent measurements. So you will have exactly the same. Because we know from our transmission line theory, if we uh, extend the layer itself by exactly lambda by two, you will have exactly the same reflection coefficient. Uh, so if you do measurements, and I'm, at one frequency, if you say just a number, now, if you can, for example, give example that what x, y, you can, uh, how you can represent one number as a frame, so that that probably. Okay. So the 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 uh, notice here is just just to to give uh, some some examples or or some numbers. Uh, of course, because I assumed linearity and I'm now working with planes and cutting and so on. But don't forget, x was our say x one the thickness of the layer. Y was our epsilon one, which is a permittivity of the, uh, of the layer. Z is what I measure, the reflection coefficient. Okay, of course, I measure here real and imaginary, I know. And, and this, is, this includes also in itself some more information, but I, I wouldn't like to make it so complex now I'm, I'm just bringing things to be as, as simple as possible. And now we will jump later to, to imagine that this R is just the magnitude of the reflection coefficient. I'm, I'm not able to measure phase. I'm, I'm able just to measure the magnitude of the reflection coefficient by measuring the sending wave ratio. I, I uh, have an incident wave, and I observe the reflected wave, and I have a SW, a SVR, a SVR uh, meter this standing wave uh, SWR meter, a standing wave ratio meter, you know, it is just measuring the maximum and minimum and gives you the uh, ratio, and you can have now only the magnitude of the reflection coefficient. Don't forget, the magnitude is function of the standing wave ratio, the phase is function of how far the first minimum is from, from the uh, interface you measure. This is basics. Of, of transmission line theory. Okay, so is it is it now explained clearly? So if we assume linear relation, we should guarantee that the number of independent equations is equal to the number of unknowns. And this is now the first in my is the first gain of this description. Because if you decide from the first beginning to involve the uh, simulators without taking this into account, and you say, okay, I have two frequencies without studying before whether these frequencies will deliver uh, linear, uh, uh, dependent or independent equations, you may fall in the trap. Because you, you, you didn't or you haven't studied the physics of the problem before involving the simulators. Therefore, as I told you in the first time, in the first lecture, we have two phase imaging. The first phase, we try to find out a very highly simplified model, which gives us the physics underlying 
the imaging process so that we understand now our limitations. The next, the next phase is this simplified model will give us rough image, which is not necessarily exact. I take this and give it to a real simulator, which calculates very, very accurately in order to find out the real image. But I have already guaranteed that I have enough information. I know exactly where should I measure, where I should simulate, and so on. The process is clear. We have two phase process. The first phase is to understand, to find out how many, whether this is dependent, not dependent, and so on. And this is actually what we describe in this lecture. The second phase, take this and try to uh, find out the exact solution. Okay, the problem of dependency is clear. Problem of dependency, I repeat it again. At least for the linear relations, you need the same number of linearly independent equations like the, your unknown. And you must really investigate the relation between what you measure outside and what you are looking for. Invis investigate it very thoroughly. So that you can say, OK, I know that these are independent. Whether now you apply the approximate method, or the simplified method, or the exact simulation, this is some, so a different issue. So one more thing. Uh, how can you guarantee that if multiple measurements are done, like more than two, three, and uh, is that there is also case that uh, the two measurements is not going to give, maybe it's not going to give linearly independent uh, type of approach. So is there also possible that if we have two, more than two number of measurements, there will it can give multiple number of solutions also? Okay, the, the equation, the, the, the um, question here, whether the multiple measurements may lead to uh, multiple, solution. multiple, multiple solutions. As long as you assume linearity, you have a unique. Because linearity means I have uh, uh, two lines intersect in just one, one point, it, it must intersect as long as they are not parallel. And when they intersect, intersect in one point. OK? What you uh, initiated now gives us now maybe five minutes for discussing some, something else, which is the noise impact and the accuracy impact. I told you here that This is unknown number one. This is unknown number two, whether it's x1 and epsilon. And we have intersection between simulation and measurements, or fo form, or, or uh, fo uh, formula and, and measurements. And this is another one. And this is actually my solution. Now, let us come, before going to the nonlinearity and this headache, Come now to practical problems. The practical problems here, what about noise? When I measure, my measurements are corrupted by noise. Corrupted by noise means that if I repeat the measurements many, many times, I once, because it was just a plane cutting, another plane. I may have this line. I may have this line. So I have a bunch of lines, depending on the noise. For each snapshot, uh, you have a line. Okay. In other words, actually, what you have is a ribbon. This is line number one. And the thickness of this ribbon is related to signal-to-noise ratio. Right? The second line is also a ripple.
if they are intersecting at 90 degree, this is the best situation. So in this case, you may have for your measurements. By the way, this ribbon here, if you look at it as probability distribution, it is something like a Gauss here. If you make measurements many, many times, and each time you put it here. So you will find that most of the measurements are collected around the average. This is a stochastical process. And if you, if you go far away from the average, uh, the probability that you can have this line is less and less. So if the, uh, back to the statistic information you had from uh, maybe communication calls, uh, you may assume Gauss distribution as long as the, the, the reason or the source of noise are many, many, which are independent which is called central theory, central limit theory. You know, you know it? Or? So the Gauss, Gauss distribution characterizes such situation. It is not, of course, the subject of our lecture, but something like that. So, so if, if you uh, would uh, represent this line by colors, depending on the intensity of lines, you will have it very, very dark in the middle, say, real black, and this black goes to uh, gray, light gray, light gray, until it is white. Can you imagine that? So it's also imaging. So it's also representing data in a visual way. So we have such a ribbon. And we have such a ribbon, the intercept. So if you look here, you will have something like a bell. Because you have Gauss here, Gauss here, you have some, something like a bell. So you may say, now I, I have the average value plus or minus the standard deviation which is which is related to uh, to the to the thickness or the thickness of this rib this is a statistical if you do measurements you usually need to to provide such additional information okay so signal to noise ratio will impact the average may be not, not affected greatly, but will impact plus or minus what? I determine, say, uh, the thickness within a tolerance of uh, 0.1 millimeter or 0.1 micrometer and so on. Okay, good. But this is actually not the problem. The problem is if you have such a, situ such a situation, your two lines, they are really, in, 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 pra in, 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 in fact, or in reality, they are linearly independent, but, but they are nearly parallel. So you have something like that. OK, so, and if you now say, I will put a ribbon, a noise ribbon, around each one, so I have one is so, and the other one is so. So now with the ribbons, your initially linearly independent relations became linearly dependent, so that you will have something like the, the intersection region is so huge that, that you cannot say where is, where is the solution. Problem is clear? Yes. So if, if we have linearly linearly independent, and the independency is something like 90 degree. And I think I still remember this was part of your PhD, <laughs> studying the vectors in n dimensional space in order to see whether they are linearly dependent or independent. Uh, if you have the lines uh, nearly parallel, and uh, on top of that, you have also inaccuracy or noisy measurements, you may have initially linearly independent situation, but nevertheless, the noise deteriorate and you cannot find a solution with a good accuracy. This is one point. I'm still, just to remind you, I'm still assuming that I have linear situation, because if we now go to the nonlinear situation, it would be much more complex. But at least we, we let us discuss the issues 
in this linear regime because it will help us understanding the different effects, to separate the effects from each other. Okay, sometimes you have the other way around, which means that your measurements gives, give you the impression they are independent. Something like, in, in reality, I just have one equation. But because of noise, I got one realization is here. And the other realization, especially if noise and corruption is, is, is strong, and the other realization is here. Because if you measure, you just have one. They are linearly dependent. So if, you, if your measurements were uh, perfectly uh, accurate, you should have had a straight line, just one straight line. But because of noise now, the noise itself created linearly independence which was not there. And you gain the impression, I solved my problem. And this is one of the most popular problems in imaging. You can read people, uh, if, you, if you look to the literature on imaging, nearly 80 to 95 percent, they rely on simulator. They don't pay any attention to the physics behind. They say, OK, what's wrong? I'm looking for epsilon of x, y, z. I will discretize my object into 10 by 10 by 10, 1,000. Therefore, I have 1,000 unknown epsilon values. I will illuminate without saying now, how can I illuminate the object? Illuminate it from one side or from different side. I will illuminate once. I will tell microwave studio, please illuminate for me. And I will measure. And because I don't know what is going on, I say, OK, how can I find different measurements? Let us change the frequency 1,000 times. And you get a system of equations. Somebody else says, no, let us change the angle from which I measure. I illuminate from here, and I measure from here. And the third one guy, uh, says, no, 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 I can't measure from this here. Let me concentrate my measurements in this here and change another parameter. So you have a big number of possibilities in which you can produce data. But if you don't understand the physics behind, you don't know whether these data are really independent or dependent. Because if, if they were dependent, so you can do what you wish. And you will never solve the problem. OK? Let me give you an example which may have been covered yesterday. You uh, uh, talked yesterday about the near field measurements. OK. One, be before going here uh, further in our discussion, one of the features of imaging is the following fact. I believe that you know that in, in the electromagnetic waves, if you have the, in a free space, say, because we measure in the free space, if you have the propagation vector K0, this K0 is a vector. This K0, for any field distribution, in free space, it is subdivided in three components. Component in X, component in Y, and component in Z. I'm, I'm, I'm talking now about the, the propagation vector. So that Kx squared plus Ky squared plus Kz squared equals K0 squared. This is clear for every one of you? OK, now let us come back to some issues which we considered before to the Fourier to the, to the uh, special Fourier transform. Kx is the frequency of the x variation. Ky is the frequency of the y variation. Kz is the frequency of the z variation. Agree on that? If we have fast variation in x, this means the corresponding frequency is high. The corresponding Kx is high. The same applies to y, the same applies to z. Agree? 
everyone understand that? Imagine now that this is the surface or the object you image and you illuminated it by a wave and it backscattered. Its backscattering is coming here. The backscattering takes place in the free space. So if I, I look here to the distribution of the backscattering, I will find out that it has uh, x component, y component, and z component. The high resolution details of the object here, which means any fast variation, say in x direction. So let us let us assume that it is a planar. So I have I have here. This is x, this is y, and this is z. And I measure I measure here. The high variation in x direction correspond to high kx. Kx is high. High variation in y also correspond to ky is high. If you exaggerate and say, okay, I would like now to see the variations within micrometer or nanometer or whatever, these are carried in high kx and high ky, which means that kx squared for this variation plus ky squared for this variation may exceed k0 squared. Right? K0, this is the operating frequency. So it is given. So at 10 megahertz, I have K0 is equal to something for, and so on. Because it's omega divided by C0. C0 is given, omega is known. So K0 is twice pi over the operating wavelength. So K0 at which you work is fixed. The details of the image, the details of the variation are hidden in Kx and Ky. High resolution, fine details correspond to Kx squared and Ky squared very, very high. Which means what remains is Kz squared. It is the propagation away. This is Kz squared. Kz squared becomes negative because I have K0 squared minus Kx squared minus Kx squared, X squared minus Ky squared. Which means, actually, the propagation in free space along the z direction now is decaying. You have, instead of e to the minus j k z z, k z is imaginary now, and you have e to the minus alpha z. This clear for every one of you? OK, this does mean the following. All high resolution details are trapped in the vicinity of the object. And if you go far away from the object in order to collect data, you lose them. Right? So you lose all, therefore, the necessity of what is called near field measurements. Because if I say, OK, if I'm measuring from far away, I lose details. And I can tell you how much details do you lose. Give me the frequency. I can calculate for you the decay and so on. So and as the resolution becomes finer and finer, more fine and more fine. Kx and Ky becomes greater and greater. And the decay of Kz becomes stronger and stronger. So you have to come nearer and nearer to the object in order to retrieve this information. Therefore, near field measurements will help. But this was actually the subject of the talk yesterday of near field measurements. I'm telling you about that because of something else. If I measure far away, this is one of my measurements, two objects with the same low resolution details but different high resolution details. So the average or the slow variation in the two objects are the same. But the high resolution details are different. The, the two objects are different. But one is, is uh, uh, they, they share the low variation or the low, low resolution details. They will appear to me far away as if they were the same. It is 
something related to Nyquist and Alizing. If you still remember, in the Alizing, if you have, say, this is T and this is X of T, now I go, and you have such a function and such a function. They have the same average. If you sample uh, with, with low sampling rate, you may see both as the same. Because, because due to the aliasing, uh, the details hidden in the, in the high variation function is, are lost. Okay? Again, the, the purpose or the, the sense of this discussion is just to tell you that you must understand that the distance from which you measure plays also a role. The far you go, the more information about the image you lose. If you don't understand that, if you just switch on your simulator and say, I'm looking for these for this, uh, 1,000 unknowns, and I have my simulator, and it can produce results as I wish, and you have a matrix, and you invert the matrix, and you have a, an image. But you don't know at all whether this image, because of the dependency and independency, wh whether this image is the correct image or it is a fake. Therefore, I decided to, to discuss the things in this way. OK, come back to our main, main ob object. We discussed now the dependency of the measurements. Let us move now to the actual problem, which, which is a nonlinearity. These equations here are of x1, epsilon 1, and omega, and r of x1 and uh, omega 1 and omega 2 are, in fact, nonlinear equations. Let us assume now that we solve the problem of dependency. I am sure now I get. Depend, uh, independent equations, so which, which would lead to a unique solution if I would have had a linear system. Now I have nonlinear system. Let us now see uh, two, two examples of the nonlinear system. Uh, first, the most simple case, one equation in, in one unknown. In one equation and one unknown, this is my unknown, x. This is my equation, a nonlinear one, and this is my measurement. R could be here, or could be here. Okay? Nonlinear equations are featured by you may have a solution, you may have multiple solutions, you may have no solution. Despite the fact that this is not like lines. Lines, the line is extended from minus infinity to infinity. The measurement is also a line in extending from minus infinity to infinity. They must meet. They must meet. And, and meet at a single point. Solution exists and unique. For nonlinear relations like the case here, uh, you have three situations. Either you don't have a solution, so you measure, but your measurement doesn't correspond to any uh, feasible profile. Or if you are lucky, maybe the solution itself is something like that. So if I cut here, I have a single. If I cut here, I have nothing. If I cut here, I have multiple. So I may have nothing, no solution, multiple solution, or single solution. This is, and I have one equation and one unknown. I will move uh, shortly to two equations, two unknowns, because it would be uh, much more complex. But if we understand two equations, two unknowns, I can extend afterwards to n equations in n unknowns, and you understand what I mean. And this is exactly why I spend now a little bit more time just to, to explain this these uh, uh, facts, uh, and so that if I generalize afterwards, you understand what I mean. 
clear to everyone? Okay. Solving nonlinear equations is another challenge. Because well, any of you do, you, do you remember how the first time you solved a nonlinear equation? When I tell you Newton Raphson tells you something? Newton Raphson method? Okay, it was the, the, the most simple nonlinear zero finding algorithm. I define here or let me have just one so for one of the known methods Newton Raphson was just give me a guess of the solution okay and I, I assume now that my measurement is zero, or, or the curve itself is the difference between measurement and, and, and simulation, or measurement and uh, equation. So that I'm looking for the zero of the function. OK? I'm looking now for the zero, so one of the legitimate methods, this iteration method, you start here. And you say, OK, I will linearize the nonlinear curve around this initial point. Linearize means I am finding the tangent and I look for the zero of the tangent. I look for the linearization of the nonlinear relation. Okay? It is now a linear problem. It became a linear problem. I have a unique solution. Now I find, is it really zero? No. I linearize again around this point. I linearize first time here. So I find the tangent, and I look for the zero of the tangent. I look for the zero of the linear problem. And I go here, and you pray that the whole process converges. Why I say pray? Because no guarantee that the that you will converge. And you may still remember, I explain it, or I repeat it for you, refreshing your information, for the one dimension. Because if I go now to 50 dimension, so everything will be much more, much more confusing. Now, for the one dimension, as you see here, uh, it is a working method. But I cannot guarantee that it can converge. Uh, you still remember, if you have a, a point at which the second derivative is zero, a deflecting point. So the whole process doesn't converge. I, I'll try to draw it for you. So this is here, second derivative, second derivative are different, and maybe here the second derivative is is, is zero. So if you have your initial point here, you go this and you are here, you go here and you are here, so you diverge. So just, just one situation where instead of converging, you have divergent, divergent behavior. People who are involved in numerics and numerical uh, techniques and so on, I think they, may, they are more acquainted than that, so than, than myself here. So they know what happens and how can I repair that. I'm just touching some of the problems which you may face if you now secure the independency, but nevertheless, you, for the one-dimensional case, you have this situation. The important result here is I need an initial guess. I need an initial guess. And I pray that this initial guess 
is near enough to the actual situ solution so that I can, after two or three iterations, I can converge. Okay? So, this is actually, uh, for, for those who start imaging purely numerically, okay, they don't know that. Because they, any, any numerical algorithm is, uh, it choose maybe an initial guess. If you, if you don't change the, the parameters of the program, maybe it, it initiates by zeros. Usually, if you, if you buy an optimization program, so, and they don't assume that you understand everything. So they would like to help you, so they initialize by zero. And you, you don't know whether this zero is a good guess, a good initial guess. In our context, this does mean that I am near enough to the solution so that I can converge after a finite number of iteration or not. This is one aspect. The second aspect is the multiple solution. Imagine now that Again, I'm looking for the zero, and I have something like that. If I have guess here, I will converge to this. If I'm, I have my first initial guess here, I will converge to this. Because you may always converge to the nearest real solution. OK? Now we have another problem, is which one is the correct one? And this is, again, one of the typical problems in imaging. Again, back to the, my discussion about kx, ky, and kz. I told you before, or we, we, I hope that you accepted <coughs> that, that different objects may deliver the same far field measurements. Different objects with the same slow variations in the image but different high variations will may cause the same measurements in the far field. And what does this mean for us? I have my measurements, and this is my equation. I may have this object, this object, or this object. Of course, I, I'm simplifying now. It is just one, one equation in, in one unknown. And I call the solution object. This is actually the entire reconstruction. But a solution now is, for me, uh, one of the possible reconstructions. So this multiple solution, this is one of the entrancing problems in imaging. Especially, as I told you before, if you perform far field measurements. Therefore, almost in all imaging, you need what are called a priori information. If you go to the doctor, imagine that, just an example, I have the same data from your uh, kidney, and somebody else images a statue, stone. And I will assume now that you have the same data. The medical doctor knows that she is investigated a human being. So if he finds that epsilon r, which, which he measures now is that of a stone or of uh, something else which cannot exist inside the human being, he can exclude that. This is what is called a priori. I'm not blindly imaging. I include maybe indirectly, I include a priori information that these are tissues. Uh, water contents is, is very, very high. I'm dealing with the uh, a kidney, with liver, with the stomach, and, and, and so on. This is this, uh, the so-called a priori information. In terms of our problem here, they help us to exclude this solution, this solution, and I'm concentrating here. In other words, if I have the initial guess, I will put it near this one. Not near this one, not near this one. In order to have my reconstruction 
as near as possible to the actual situation. Problem is clear. So for nonlinear, in addition to the <coughs> in addition to the uh, to the problem of dependent or independent, we have the problem of multiple solution or even no solution. And under certain circumstances, we may also have infinite number of solutions. But now I am touching some of the difficulties which you can uh, you can meet. Okay, this is this explanation. I hope it was clear enough for the one-dimensional case, which is actually very very trivial. Imagine now that I will ba come back to my just one layer, just one dielectric layer problem. I'm looking for thickness and dielectric corners. In this case, we agree that we have two nonlinear equations, and we uh, produce or generate these solutions at two different frequencies. Due to the nonlinearity, again I will draw three dimensional and after cutting with the measurements I will have the one di the two dimensions. My unknowns are x and y. These are I'm not good in drawing, but imagine now that the nonlinear is a bell and the other nonlinear is a carpet, like a large deal. Okay? So if you now your measurement is always the constant which you have measured, which is a plane parallel to the XY plane. Correct? So it will cover the bell in a circle or in an ellipse. Say something like that. So this is, in, in, in the linear case, it was a straight line. And it will cover the carpet, which is the second one, in another curve, maybe this way. Now I have two contours. They are not straight lines anymore. Cutting, this is my measurements, cutting the first nonlinear equation gives rise to first contour. Cutting the second nonlinear equation gives rise to a second contour. The two contours will be drawn in the xy plane. The intersection or intersections are my solutions. For this simple case, you may have two. But imagine you have real, really a real carpet. This curve here may be something like that. So you cut something which is going up and down, and you cut now, and, and, and the contour itself is crazy. Or the two contours are crazy. So every nonlinear situation gives rise to something else. We are still able to imagine, because if I increase now the number of unknowns to three and four, you will lose imagination. So uh, therefore, I concentrate now on, 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 on one dimension and two dimension. In, in, the, in this simple two dimensional case, imagine that the non, first nonlinear equation cut by the first measurement gives rise to contour number one. Second nonlinear equation cut by the corresponding measurement gives rise to contour number two. Now the two contours may have no common points, something like one contour, one contour, single point, two points, three points, 100 points. It's exactly like the one-dimensional case as, as we had the, the curve cutting the x-axis at multiple points. But now it is a little bit more sophisticated. But you know it now. What are the challenges facing us in the imaging? Again, we would like to uh, look for one of these intersections, which is as much uh, similar or as similar as possible to the current situation. 
And in most of the cases, you need a priori information. Uh, imaging equipment, when they are sold to uh, doctors, they don't confuse people who are not specialists. Because the doctor is a specialist maybe in diagnostic and so on. But if you, if you are a company and you, you sell a, an imager, you will not tell him or tell her uh, that uh, there are ambiguity in your solution. You decide, you, solve, you decide, okay, I will take this one. And I will not tell him or tell her. Because if you, if you create confusion in your cl client, he will not buy or she will not buy. So therefore, and this is known especially in imaging because imaging has lots of ambiguity, lots of uncertainty because of this. So I'm trying now to relate the real problem with the, with the, uh, with the theory because imaging in itself, intrinsically ambiguous, multiple solution problem. And the entire research in the imaging is not about the, these fundamentals, but it is about how can I simplify my life, how can I Im involve something available like software algorithms and so on, uh, how can I exclude solutions so that uh, the rest is as near as possible to the real situation and so on. But please keep this in mind because this is a natural, a natural problem uh, stick to the imaging itself. Okay, good. Let us see now. Uh, let us see now uh, how can we solve first the two dimensional problem. Okay? The one dimensional I gave you as an example, the, this uh, new trust. So by, by uh, finding, uh, by starting by an initial guess, uh, linearize around the initial guess, find the solution of your linearization which is unique, find the value of the function at your solution, linearize again and again and again, and pray that the whole process will converge. This is in the one dimension. In the two dimensional, it's very, very similar. But now, imagine that the, uh, let us make it also as a zero, zero problem, which I'm, I'm looking for the zeros of two dimensional uh, function. So zeros, zeros of two dimensional functions, some, something like I'm going over a plateau higher than the earth, the Earth is my zero, okay? And from time to time, I see a hole. Is it good, good, good correspondence? So I have, I, I, it's exactly like, like I'm looking for y of x equals zero, and I'm looking for the zeros. Now, the problem can be uh, reformulated in such a way uh, that you are looking for zeros of a two-dimensional function. The two-dimensional function is a surface, carpet or bell or something like that, and the zeros are holes. So, and you are going now on, on this plateau, maybe it's some hills, some valleys and so on, and you are looking for the holes, the deep holes. Of course, in a deep hole, if you are near enough and try to perform Newton Ruffs Linearize, linearize is a slope. Find out as if, are you sliding? Huh? Find out the solution. You are nearer to the hole. Find out the solution. So typically, if you have a, if you have a hole, so it is something, the, the slope here is slow. But if you come here, you, you will go down. You will go down, and this is actually the convergence. Convergence mean, means here, if I am I'm near enough to the actual hole, so, and I perform two or three iterations, I will fall down. Okay, I, I started by one dimensional, the two dimensional is a little bit funny, 
But, but it's actually this, the same situation. And if you understand it this way, you can program very, very nice, really. So if you, if you are a programmer and you, uh, your task is, I, I'm looking for the zeros of a two-dimensional function. So if you keep this in mind and you try to find the scenario, so your program is really good. But again, we, have, we still have the same problem. Are we near from this hole, this hole, this hole? And are we near, near enough or not? So I just formulate the questions. There is no unique answer. So the answers to these questions, I just give you a proposal for, uh, for say, uh, uh, this uh, uh, a priori information, whether I'm uh, performing medical imaging or I'm performing uh, 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 health, uh, health monitoring. Because, by the way, imaging is also used for health monitoring, not your health, health monitoring of objects like, uh, like bridges and uh, like uh, buildings. You are looking for cracks in uh, concrete, uh, you are looking for defaults in the wings of an aeroplane. All these are areas of imaging uh, or other, other uh, application which, is, which has uh, lots of money is uh, the oil field. In the oil field, you also perform imaging very, very extensively because when you are drilling, uh, you would like to collect information about the soil in your or the ground in your vicinity in order to predict am I going now to meet a granite uh, layer or it is limestone or it's water. So, uh, so imagers are also uh, built on the drilling mechanism so that you can collect data. So if we are talking about imaging, uh, one of the applications is, is uh, of course, the uh, medical imaging. Uh, other application is a, is a health monitoring for civil engineering. The two branches which, which have lots of money are oil and medicine. If you are sick, you are, you'd like to give all what you have in order to be healthy. So therefore, doctors are rich and they can afford asking you for just one image, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, and you pay it without any discussion. The same situation is also in oil field. Therefore, if you look to the, to the equipment, maybe from the uh, technical point of view, it is the same. But you sell it once to hospital, you sell it once to an oil company, so you can charge maybe millions, but if you are selling to a poor civil enge engineering uh, office which uh, conducts some uh, investigation for a house or for an old building, you ca he, he or she cannot afford that, therefore you ask for less money. But from the technical point of view, maybe it is exactly the same image. Okay? Good. So, let me... I, I hope, yes. Uh, should, should we make a... Yeah. Okay, good. No, no. Okay, <laughs> so... <laughs> good. Uh, when should, should we meet? Uh, yeah. It is now... Uh, half an hour. Half an hour, so, so quarter yeah. past, past 11. Okay, yeah. so yeah. in half an hour.